At this time, we have a sermon from Mr. Barnabas Grayson entitled, Be Ye Doers. Mr. Grayson. Well, greetings to all of you and a good afternoon. I'm sure uh, you're anxious to get out and see if you can build a snowball or something, or a snowman, that is. Whenever it snowed, I used to look forward to snow coming down and school closing and all that stuff. But now, getting older, I have to walk very carefully out there on the snow. So hopefully everybody will be doing okay this afternoon. And greetings to all of you that are on the internet also who are watching. Title of this message, as you have on your handout, is Be Ye Doers. Be Ye Doers. James said that over in chapter 1 and verse 22, and on, your, uh, on the bulletin has verse 21. It should be verse 22. But the Apostle James, he wrote this, saying, Be ye doers of the word, and not hear, hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So, we know from the Bible, we're acquainted with the Bible, and there are a lot of do's and don'ts in the Bible. Some are man-made, uh, so it is the word of God that we realize that is, you know, the important, uh, not man's. In chapter 3 of Colossians, and a lot of the... Uh, uh, text for this afternoon's sermon will come from Colossians. In chapter 3 of Colossians, the Apostle Paul, he wrote the, these words as admonishment and also as warning to the uh, hearers. With these words, he is going to be trying to get across the will and the word of God and not uh, man's way. And he begins in verse 9 saying to lie not to one another. So you, uh, we look out across our landscape today, around the world, in the nation, country, and local and uh, widespread, that we see a lot of falsehoods that are, that are going on. But he's saying, especially to those within the church, to lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man and with his deeds. And that you have put on the new man or the new person, which is uh, renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, that created man. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, uh, nor free or uh, bond, but Christ is in all. So once you've put off the old man, and put on the new man, you realize that Christ is in you, dwelling in you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and then to pay attention to what his word says. So, in looking at these, where Christ is all and in all, all the distinctions are removed. And that includes the national uh, distinctions, as in Jew and Gentile that the uh, religious distinction as those, you know, who are circumcised and are uncircumcised and cultural distinction in which some come from a perhaps a wild and nomadic background and other distinctions like, like class or economic distinctions are removed. So when you become followers of Jesus Christ, you become a new creature in Christ. as That's what we are as Christians with Christ dwelling in us through the power of his word. So the Apostle Paul showed these uh, things regardless of all those distinctions that separate us, uh, often separate us one from another. But believers are to do away with the former self and all those things that, that divide and become created in the image of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, Paul saying, Put on therefore as the elect of God, 
holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. Do we have bowels of mercies? How about kindness, humbleness of mind, and meekness, long suffering, you know, which is, which is patience. So we see as the elect of God that the, uh, this word elect is from the Greek word electos, which means the select or the chosen uh, by God. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. But if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. So if we're wanting to continue holding a grudge against someone and haven't forgiven, we need to remember how Christ has, think about ourselves and remember how Christ has forgiven us. Because if we don't forgive, it could lead back to those sins that the old man had in, in his deeds. Verse 8 uh, above will, tells about the anger and the wrath and the malice and the blasphemy, the filthy communications. Uh, these things, uh, you could turn back to them if there is no forgiving. Verse 14, and above all these things, to put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. It holds, you know, things together. It holds the church together. It holds families together. And it holds nations together. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be you thankful. Now, in our world today, we see divisions, we see strife brought on by the distinctions that are man-made, that man has, and they divide us. But the closer a Christian is to God, the more he can get along with others. And to be the person in the image of Christ that, that we are meant to be. So as we look at these, uh, these words, these virtues that we see in, in, in these verses, we can compare these things that we see with ourselves. We can look at the word, for example, kindness. Do we have kindness? So in these verses, we can see how we are brought closer to Jesus Christ. Now, when the apostle wrote these words, it was in a letter to a church that he had not uh, visited. But the church that he is writing this letter to was founded by a, a minister who was a minister there uh, in Colossae, Epaphras. And Paul identified him as a dear fellow servant and a faithful minister of Christ and a, also a fellow prisoner as uh, in Christ. And this letter was perhaps written by Paul from uh, Rome at the time. But it was from this minister, Epaphras, that he heard about the saints in Colossae. And so he wrote, or wrote a letter to them. And according to Bible commentators, the main purpose of this letter was to warn, was to warn them against heresy. Specifically, to warn the Colossian church of a dangerous philosophy that was creeping in, which was an early form of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is defined as a mix of philosophical and religious ideas, that is, uh, humanistic and, and uh, philosophical or spiritual concepts, and that these were masquerading as a form of Christianity in which believers had access to uh, superior hidden knowledge or gnosis, a knowledge that was hidden and spiritual that only a few could understand or know or be a part of. But it also led to an immoral lifestyle so that what one did in the body didn't matter. But ever how one looks at it, this was a false teaching that was taking root among the church there to which Paul warned them with these words. And how it fits our time today, we can only speculate, but we know that the world today has its overt and covert 
organizations, councils, clubs, political parties, and so on, that all uh, uh, seem to have a draw that makes people want to be a part of it. But the focus in those things, it's shifted from being in Christ to belonging to some new nosos or uh, intuition and opinions and get it mixed with Christianity. But Christ in us seeks to put into us the image of God, to be like God, to have the very nature of God and things that don't come really easy sometimes because it's hard to be kind when you don't want to be kind. So that is how we grow in grace and knowledge by practicing some of these virtues that we see in the scriptures. And so in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul is warning, he says, to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain or empty deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So there are a lot of these things in the world that are not after uh, Christ. They're not according to his word. They're not according to his righteousness. They're not according to, his, uh, to the manner of being a Christian. For example, it was thought that matter, you know, things uh, that are solid, things that are matter, is just, uh, doesn't matter, it's evil. And the only thing that's uh, good is the spirit, you know, that ethereal part of, of humanity. And which led to the thought that Christ didn't create the world, the physical world, because a perfect supreme being would not have direct contact with an evil world. And so this, this philosophy, the, the Gnosticism, to me at least, it's pretty well complicated how anyone could, you know, contrive such concepts. But the focus was off Christ. He was not, uh, he's not a part of those things. Instead, it becomes a part of, of things that uh, man commands. In verse 20 of Colossians 2, it says, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? You know, touch not, handle not, all of these things, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. And in verse 23, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So it all looks smart, it all looks wise, it all looks like it's reasonable, but they are not after uh, Christ and his word. So they have the appearance of wisdom, but in fact are just useless ways. So as we look upon our surroundings and our society today, we know that we have to be careful because there are such, play, uh, such organizations that have, seem to have a, a gnosis, a, a knowledge, you know, they say it, uh, a knowledge is power, and to know something somebody else doesn't know just causes, causes vanity. And so Paul is writing to warn the Colossians of this Gnosticism that's creeping in. But the next aim of Paul is to teach the church to become rooted in Jesus Christ and not let the vain deceits that we see weaken their faith in Christ or his word. For we ought to, as I don't know that remember the scripture, but it says we ought to obey God rather than man. That is, you know, the written word of God and to be the doers of his word and not hearers, uh, hearers only. All of these things that we look at in the Bible, like I said earlier, there are a lot of do's and don'ts. And the ones that matter are the ones that come from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who set the example, who set uh, the way of life. So as we 
we'll see in this sermon, the emphasis of Paul is on the quality of living which is made possible when one's life is transformed by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that opens our eyes, that causes us and helps us to see the light of his word and apply them in our life. So we can read this as the Apostle Paul writing not just to the uh, church at Colossae in his day, but also to the elect of God today, to us personally, to me, to you. In Colossians up in chapter 1, uh, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So we know that when we make prayer, it is often not just for ourselves, but for others that are a part of the, of, of the body that we know who are in the church of God. So there is somebody praying for you sometimes. Sometimes when we might feel like things are going against us and, and suddenly we might feel uh, an uplift, something going on in our life that gives us a positive look at our circumstances. I remember uh, going to a funeral of a friend that I knew for a long time when he was over in Korea, and I've probably mentioned this before, but uh, when he was over there, he, there, you know, the, the coal and, and, you know, what we see out here, uh, there in the trenches and foxholes beside the armory, uh, armored tanks and stuff, that there was a dread, but he got this feeling of, of having faith and not fearing like he was. And when he thought that, it came to his mind that someone must be praying for him. So, you know, sometimes it happens to us that when we are feeling down, that somebody may be praying for us. And perhaps in our daily life, when we have a situation, where we have a trial, where something goes in our favor, that somebody has prayed for us. That's why we pray, especially here, you know, during the prayer request. We pray for others, and we hope that our prayer is going to touch the lives of those who are in need uh, of God's intervention. But we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. There is a hope that we all share that's laid up for all of us in heaven. Whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Which is come unto you as it is in all the world. And brings forth fruit as it does also in you. Since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I remember speaking to, uh, talking with a minister a long time ago, asking about, you know, when we pray for someone, uh, how is it that, uh, how is it that it affects their life? And like I uh, spoke earlier, that he doesn't know all of the situations that uh, people are going through, and he, he was a minister of a church. But he just told me, he just said that 
like the scripture here says, uh, we heard it, since the day we heard it, we do, uh, do not see, cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That would uh, kind of sum up what a prayer for others might be, that they might be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So when it comes to mind, when we may not know specifically what someone is going through in a trial or trouble, that this, we pray that they will be filled with the knowledge of his will, of, of God's will and wisdom. That they, or in here, in here in this sentence, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's what, you know, Paul was praying and along with Timothy. So this is what we would pray for one another. That insert whatever name that they might be filled to walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing. In verse 11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Something we ask of, of whoever it is we might be praying for or someone, uh, a group in general, for, for example. Say like the church down there in Texas or in Missouri or Kansas or wherever. And giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in lights, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we're translated from, take, carried over from the power of darkness, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So we have forgiveness of sins. Whatever our sins were, and when we come to decide to cast off the old man and put on uh, Christ, we have the forgiveness of sin. Who is the image of the, the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he's before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So it, the focus is on Christ. It, the focus is on his word. The focus is on our prayers for one another. Instead of trying to be a part of something secret. Or some gnosis that other people aren't a part of. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him. And so we're looking at what Christ has done for us. And so in, uh, in the end. It's what we do for Jesus Christ. By reading the words. Uh, uh, that he has set before us to follow. Verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated. And enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now has he reconciled. In the body of his flesh. Through, through death. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I Paul am made a minister you can read the rest of that 24 uh, through 29 but these words, the words we read, were to the elect, to the Colossians, as, as just an important uh, thing to do in his time. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 
we're giving a way to go, a way to believe, and a way uh, to righteousness by reading the word of God. But what if we don't do them? In Deuteronomy 28.1, it says, And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord, your God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I, which I command you this day, that the Lord, your God, will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And as we read throughout, we see that there are blessings in the city, that there will be blessings in the city, blessings in the field, that they will have uh, many offspring, they will have abundant crops, large flocks and herds, blessings of fruit and grain, blessings that are just coming and going. Verse 28 uh, verse 15 of chapter 28, But it shall come to pass, if ye shall not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So everything opposite the bless blessings that we read of uh, will take place. And from verse 15 on to the end of the chapter, uh, you can look at, read all those, and it does not look good. Verse uh, 58 of Deuteronomy 28. From the Living Bible, in verse 58 and 59. If you refuse to obey all the laws written in this book, thus refusing reverence to the glorious and fearful name of Jehovah your God, then Jehovah will send perpetual plagues upon you and upon your children. As you know, we are going through a pandemic and it's, it's really causing a lot of uh, political, religious, and social stir, which can affect our Christian attitudes in knowing uh, to do what is right. And it can make us uh, for, forget that no matter what, uh, we're to be clothed with righteousness and not fall into uh, the way of thinking that, that the world, how the world is going on around us. But love has become pretty much love for self. But this is the love of God, 1 John 3, 5. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments aren't grievous. But see, some see the Old Testament with its do's and don'ts and its penalties is harsh and out of date. But as James said, be ye do doers of the law. So we know if we break the law, it's, it breaks us. It breaks us, if you will. But some, of course, think, you know, this law is done away. But the scripture says, because the scripture says, and they look at it in a different way, Cursed is, is every one that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So the curse of the law is made clear in Romans where it says that sin is a transgression of the law and the wages of sin is death. And we know that death is the curse. It is the uh, condemnation. It's the, it's the hex. It's all that uh, brought on by disobedience. In 1 John 5, 3, uh, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Now, Romans chapter 7, verse 12, it tells us that the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. So just as Moses gave the elders and the elders gave the people the commands of God, so our Christians today expected to see those, to read those, and to abide by those, and say amen like they did to those laws that are given. So Christ did not come to do away with the law. We know that by replacing it with, you know, grace as some take it, in which nothing else is expected but to just have faith in God and love for Jesus. But we read that there is a penalty attached a curse for not being a doer of the law. And just we just need to remember 
the words of Christ, he said, if you will enter into life, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, there are many times when I have known to do good, but, you know, have not done so. And to know to do good, as it says, and do it not, it says, it's sin. But this is where faith in God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ comes in. Because he knows that we are flesh and we're not perfect in our keeping of the law, of the word of God. So there are temptations in which we may, we may fail. But when we became Christians, and when we were baptized, we became a part of Jesus Christ. Through his death, the power of our sinful nature was broken. It was buried with him in baptism when, when he died. And when God the Father brought him back to life again, we were given new life. To also become a new creature to live. Not as we once lived. Not as you know, servants of sin. But as servants of righteousness. Commandment keepers. Doers of the law. But we have to look to Jesus. Knowing that through him we have an advocate. Through him we have still uh, ongoing forgiveness. If we are willing to change. And, and keep on keeping his commandments. So we look to Jesus, and the Apostle Paul knew this, and he, the only way he could be saved from the body of sin is to have faith in what Jesus Christ has done for him. In Ephesians chapter 2, you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein time past you walked according to the course of this world. Is that what we did before we came into this, uh, into the church, accepting Jesus Christ. We walked according to the way of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were, and were by nature the children of wrath. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins. Has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. By grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God has before ordained. That we should walk in them. So we are. A workmanship. We are a work in progress. And this was ordained for us when we decided to cast off the old man and, and become a new creature in Christ. Uh, we can imagine ourselves like a, uh, a vessel that is being shaped by a, a potter. So what makes a good citizen anywhere is to know the laws of uh, of that uh, place and to abide in those laws if not we know that there is a curse or that there is a penalty so it matters how we behave in life and that there are, we know that there are laws that will help us along Philippians 3.20 says that our, that our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ that's our homeland. In the meantime, how are we to be in this life as good citizens and forerunners of that kingdom that is to come? As we know, we live in perilous times, dangers of every sort. No need to cite all the problems that we see uh, confronting us, the sufferings or the deaths. But as God 
But as Paul told Timothy, that in the last days it's going to be tough to be a Christian because people will only love themselves, won't have the time to hear what good news there is and, and how to uh, live according to the will of God in Jesus Christ. Daniel 9.11, it says that all Israel have transgressed your law, even by departing, that they might not obey the, uh, your voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. In Ephesians, refer to Ephesians uh, chapter 5, it says to be ye followers of God. Paul said as dear children to be followers of God and to walk in love as Christ also loved us. He gave himself for, as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling uh, sacrifice or a savior. Colossians 1, 21 through 23, you were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works Yet now has he re reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and, un and unreprovable in his sight. That's the work that's going on in us as we look to his word and be doers of the word. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard which was preached to every creature under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Colossians chapter 2, uh, 6 and 7, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. When you look at the word rooted, uh, if I know uh, the other day I was pulling up some plants, and the ones that were deeply rooted, uh, it, it was hard to do uh, without hurting your hands or straining yourself to, uh, to pull up that plant. So that's, if we're doers of the word, we would, it will be hard for things in our life to, uh, that go against us to root us up to root us out of the word of God. So we need to be rooted, built up in him, and be established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Colossians chapter 3, put on therefore as elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, what I read earlier about you know, meekness and patience. For bearing one another, Forgiving one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Colossians 3, 23 through 25. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that does wrong shall receive the wrong which he has done, and there is no respect of persons. So when you think about doing something wrong, you need to know that there are consequences. Think twice about uh, what, what you're going to do if it's going to do someone else wrong. Colossians 4 says in verses 5 through 6, to walk in wisdom. Toward them that are without, redeeming the time. And let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Romans chapter 2, 12 through 13. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. James chapter 1. I'm not going to read all of this, but verse 12. Blessed is a man that endures temptation. 
For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So it requires faith, it requires diligence, it requires obedience, it requires just tenacity to do what uh, we're to do in the sight of God that will please him. Because, in verse 14, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So do not err, he says, my beloved brethren. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from uh, above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of righteous naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Verse 24, uh, verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He beholds himself, goes his way, straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looks into the law of liberty and continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So, well, I will conclude, I guess, with the... Uh, few more uh, verses kind of recap what, where we've been Colossians 1:10. all these verses we've read and as well as you know there are other places that uh, that uh, support them verse 10 says all these verses that we've we've heard or read are for this reason that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. In Colossians chapter 2. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. So walk you in him. Rooted. Built up in him. Established in the faith. As you have been taught. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. And to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. If it's not after Christ, then we have to beware. Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of, Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. That is, you know, in his honor, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So we do all in honor to the Lord because the eyes of God are upon his people, upon his elect so he knows what we are doing Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving and down in verse 18 we see Paul concluding saying the salvation by the hand of me Paul and he says to remember my bonds grace be with you amen so we need to be devoted to prayer as well as, you know, doers of the word to be watchful, to be thankful and also, as Paul said, to, re to remember my bonds and to remember the bonds of others. That is, you know, their trials, their troubles, the things that they are going through and pray for them to remember them that we may be healed also. We know that Christ paid for our sins. His sacrifice has reconciled us to God. And through his word, he gives us the way to truth and to life. 
and what we should be doing. Verse 12 of, Corinthians, of Colossians 3. Put on therefore as the elect of God. Holy in the love. Those bowels of mercy. Kindness. Humbleness of mind. Meekness. And long suffering. All the way through verse 16. I won't uh, read those. But. Be doers of the word. Not hearers only. Now. I would like to tie. The uh, first message that Sean gave. Because I think the, the, it's an appropriate end to this particular sermon. The sermon here to the verse it says in James 4.17. To know to do good and do it not, it is sin. But in John 13.17, uh, it says, Now that you know these things. Now that you know these things. These things that we have read from these verses. You will be blessed or you will be happy if you do them. So be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. And look to the word of God, to Jesus Christ. And keep our faith in the things that he has promised us. And the blessings of his, of his word.